now. Let me load up the block catcher and the spot miner. Hello. Yo. Welcome. So random fact, but hi, Kathy. Hi. I can only stay for part of the time because I'm actually back in school now. Oh, okay. So I'll watch the end of it um, later on after it's posted. Cool. No worries. We've got a lot of people watching the recording today. So, so kids are back, Kathy? Um, no, we're in meetings and stuff. Kids okay. come back on Wednesday. Okay. We're doing uh, meet and greets and virtual orientations and all that kind of stuff over these past few days. And it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> very it's interesting. It's a Rhode Island State holiday, it's, I, which I completely forgot about until. Here. I don't know if you can see. Smile with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you see? I was going to say, Ryan, is it Victory Day today? It is. I was born and raised in Rhode Island. Hey. Yep. Yes, and they didn't rename it in time. There was a, a, <laughs> push, a push to do that, but yep. didn't didn't happen. Um, yeah, it's nice having an, an August state holiday that no one else yep. has, so the beaches aren't too bad, but. Alrighty, uh, we've got a few, we're going to wait a couple more minutes to see if anybody else can make it. But again, we got a lot of people joining to watch the recording. Um, while we're waiting, if you want to tell us what your favorite game to play with students is, you can tell us in the chat or just shout it out. And does it have to be an unruly game or could it just be a favorite class for you? Any game you want. My kids love to do the freeze dance. Oh, freeze dance. Yeah. Freeze dance. And we have all kinds of things. Sometimes I ring the bell and they have to go in a different direction or there are all kinds of things. But it's like, when I see that they're squirrely, we do freeze dance. <laughs> that would be a good splats game. I'm, I'm thinking of things. By the way, my splats are on their way. They should be here tomorrow. Woo. I'm so excited. Want to describe <laughs> freeze dance? Oh, so it's like you, while the music is playing, kids are dancing. And then as soon as the music stops, they have to freeze. And then mm -hmm. if you didn't freeze, then you're out. Cool. So I just have to program the, that into the splats. I could definitely do that. Yeah. When it gets down to a few kids, I used to like to say it was a dance off. And then they had to face yeah. each other and do their best moves. <laughs> I, usually, I usually have them dance against me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I always do something goofy and they win. So <laughs> <laughs> they know. <laughs> Alrighty, it is 105. We're gonna go in. Um, all right, thanks for joining us today, live or recorded. Um, we're gonna be talking all about game creation today. Um, so really every aspect of it. Um, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So we're excited for this one. Um, so we're gonna talk about just why games in general. Um, we're gonna talk about game sourcing and where can you get inspiration for games. Um, some different tips for uh, supporting game creation in your classroom. And then we're going to spend some time uh, exploring some game brainstorming ideas at the end. All right. Uh, on, uh, from the team today, we've got myself. I'm, hi, I'm Emily. Ryan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Ryan. I do some content creation, game making. I was an immersive experience producer and a puzzle designer for a long time. Uh, I'm Tuan. I used to be an inclusion teacher for Boston Public Schools, teaching predominantly third, fourth, and fifth grade. And now I am a content creator and I do some customer success to make sure that everyone feels good about the slots and empowered by the slots. Hey everybody, my name is Paul. I'm the Chief Creative Officer here at Unruly. So um, just in charge of making sure that everything stays nice and unruly here, uh, as well as working with the product team on getting um, the app made uh so we you know i started from version one of the app and um you know as, as most of you know we're about to release version two um so yeah very excited to talk to you today about some games and some creativity with spots all right so first thing i just wanted to get out of the way here is that 
everybody here, I'm not going to try to convince you that games are great. I think everybody here, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know that games were great. So um, we're really just going to talk about how you can make more games. That's what the whole, whole rest of this time is going to be about. So where can you find games, just in general, if you're talking about them? Uh, with Splats, you can find them in the app um, underneath uh, the Unruly Examples in either the 2.0 or V1 of the app. Uh, our lesson plans and basically everything on the portal, they all, or a lot of our things, feature games. Um, you also have them already in your classroom routine. So what do you and your students already play? And your imagination is another really big source of games. So uh, one thing that if you've been to some of our other stuff that we like to talk about a lot is just how the rules for the game are the rules for the code. And that's something that uh, appears again and again and again. And I think that's also something that makes, um, it makes everything fun. And it also, I think, is a really great learning tool, especially for coding. I'm going to turn this over to Paul here. Hey, um, yeah, so we're going to start with using Whack-A-Mole, which is probably one of our more popular games. Um, kind of a really easy game to understand because the context, everyone's played it before, probably at a carnival or something. Um, and uh, it's kind of easy to understand how that translates to splats. Um, but what's nice about this too is it's going to kind of allow us to talk a little bit more about the content and context in game creation and how those two can influence each other. Um, so what we have here for Whack-A-Mole, uh, there's two versions of how you can describe a game that you've programmed with your splats. Um, so in version one, when talking about it, we can say stomp on splat when it's purple and get a point, stomp on splat when it's green and lose a point. Um, I think everybody would understand that if we're playing it in the classroom, you know, the kids would certainly understand the rules there and, and they'd probably have a lot of fun playing it. But um, a, a simple switch of like adding or changing the context here and um, applying a little creativity or a little, in this case, familiar context to kids. Um, so we're going to make that purple splat, suddenly we're going to make it a mole in a game of whack-a-mole. Um, and, you know, depending on the age that the, the, ki the kids are that are playing this, but I, I, I still think probably even through eighth grade, they'd have a lot of fun with this. But the idea that, that now this purple light, suddenly you're stomping on it, uh, is a mole that's popping up out of the ground. Um, that's the idea of the context shaping um, uh, the content, right? Where you're, you're giving, um, or I'm sorry, the flip side of that, that, the content, which is the code in the context, which is either your environment or an imaginary um, application here of applying the moles to the gameplay. So we have the content, which is the code that we made that, all right, we're going to, we're going to assign these properties. Here's a point if it's, if it's one color and you lose a point if it's another. Um, but, you know, we're, we're dealing, when we're creating games with kids, we're dealing with a, you know, one of the most powerful forces, I think, uh, known to, to human beings, and that's the imagination of, of children. Um, and I think when, when I'm thinking about games or creating games, uh, you know, I like to um, quote or think about Rodney Mullen, who's a, a, a skateboarder that, that I love and a really influential speaker too. But one of the things that he talks about um, when talking about like context and, and content as related to skateboarding, but I think it applies to his flats too, is the idea of like allowing the cognitive mind to sit back and let intuition drive sometimes. Um, and I think, I think um, you know, to get used to that when you're thinking about code, takes a little bit of like undoing because there's there's maybe people who have no experience with code or maybe even some, but find uh, more complicated code maybe a little intimidating. Um, you know, you might be stuck on kind of the block format or how, how the code kind of works to to get the game that you want um, to happen. And, and that's great because you do have to learn those things. They're kind of the, the cornerstone of, of how you're gonna make your games. But um, one of the things that you don't want to lose sight of is letting that, that cognitive bit sit back a little bit because what kids are really good at, uh, as you know, is just creating and inventing games. So as they're learning the basics of, of splats, um, they're going to want to apply these basics to their, um, to their creation. So one, um, sorry, one example really quick that I want to talk about too is um, Cliff jumper, and that's one of the included examples that we have. So that's a similar thing to whack-a-mole, where you're jumping back and forth between splats. You have to land on them with the screen. If you don't, you miss, you miss the other cliff you're jumping to. Uh, that changes the whole context of the game. I tried that out with my son, and, and suddenly it's super perilous. The stakes are high, because if I miss this now, I'm not just missing a point, I'm actually missing a cliff, and you know, may, may not be a great outcome. 
Um, yeah, but I'm going to let Emily take over a little bit here on tips and tricks, and, and we can circle back to some of this too later on. Awesome. And we'll also be talking about context and content, and we'll be saying that in different ways uh, throughout. Um, so when we talk about context, usually we're talking about different game elements. So what's going into the game? What's the imagination behind it? And then the content could be the actual code itself. It could be the rules. Um, and we'll be, we'll be revisiting that a whole bunch. Um, so we wanted to just talk about, we have a lot of games that come from the Unruly team. Uh, what do we think about um, whenever we're coming up with games? So I'm gonna let uh, Paul talk about this one first. Right. Yeah, this one was uh, is a, a favorite of mine still. And um, quick backstory, the team was, uh, we had an in-person meeting in Newark, New Jersey, and we were taking a team trip over to Medieval Times for some jousting and, um, <laughs> and dinner. And so I thought like, all right, let's make a jousting game here. So to, um, you know, basically start out just getting the feel of like what's involved with jousting, right? Kind of the fun, the spirit of it. And then unpacking it, obviously I wasn't able to bring um, shields, lances and horses into the into the office, but um, basically created a game that was the spirit of it, right? Which is basically a competition, who gets somewhere first and who strikes first, right? In this case, striking is stepping on the opponent's flat. Um, so we have a little video here to show how this is played out, um, not in our office, which was super fun too. And I think Emily might, be the winner of our joust competition, if I remember correctly. But it was a here's... July, September, so. That's right. So we still need to, we still need to crown the winner. <laughs> here's right. some video of kids playing. <sighs> <laughs> so what I what I think you might not be hearing there, I'm not sure because I couldn't really hear it too well. Uh, so when I made that game, some of the things that are really important to kind of like really help shape that context is, uh, you know, put some ho uh, horse sounds in there. That's kind of the start of the game. So, uh, but even before that, there's a little trumpet sting that I made using our, um, you know, our unruly MIDI. And so the kids are like chomping at the bit, you know, almost literally in this case. And then once that horse sound starts, they know it's ready. They're ready to go. So just those little tweaks and like using the tools that we have in the app um, and, and the sounds that you can get out of this class can really, really enhance and go a long way in, uh, in shaping part of the gameplay. Yep. And this is just one example of designing for a theme, but there are all sorts of examples. I think, uh, Deb, one of the ones, the famous ones that it always comes from, <laughs> from Winter Hill is uh, Bobbing for Apples. So um, not really switching around, not really switching around a game that much in terms of the code itself, but you're designing the rules completely around like what you want to play. And it was fall and wanted to bob for apples. All right. So um, another thing when, that we think about sometimes whenever we're designing a particular game is we think about an experience that we want. Um, so this first video I'm going to show you um, is the results of us trying to create a puzzle game. So we knew that the experience was that we wanted um, students to be solving a puzzle. So we designed the game all around that. And so um, the way this works is um, students have to find, figure out how to create, make all of them green. So I'll show you, whoops, go back. I'll show you one more time. Uh, when they first are figuring, when students are first trying to figure this out, um, it takes them quite a few times to actually figure out, oh, like I have to press and hold on the splats. And how do I press and hold on them if there's more splats than there are feet or maybe they're spread apart? Um, so things start to get pretty creative after that. Um, and then this other example on the right um, is us trying to design a game specifically for um, racing. So oh, why do I keep doing that? Here we go. And so this is all trying to, um, again, we're designing a game specifically for racing. Um, and that's what the whole game is revolving around. All right. Uh, so the next thing we've got up is reimagining what a splat can be. And I'm going to have uh, Ryan talk a little bit about this. Yeah. So especially in pack two, uh, we spent a lot of time working with how splats can really be imagined to be anything. Like they're imagined to be a Lance arena, and in this case, we have splat mining and splat to shoot up, which are meant to imagine the splat as a, like a geode and a rock hammer or the old parachute game you'd play in the gym. And using the splats in ways that are completely unrelated to 
code and not seeing them as a big Bluetooth device, but as a, uh, an imagined object or activity that you're doing. Um, splat mining, I think I have up here. Is that, want to switch over to? Yeah, you can take over. So this is a slightly modified from the one that we built in, in pack two, and it's all laid out with how the rules go. So the rules for splat mining, it's a single splat, and it's meant for one, one or a few, a few players to play. When you start the program, it will lay out a jewel in the center and brown rock bits around the outside. And the goal of the game is to click on the splat and knock off those little bits of rock without damaging the jewel in the center too much. We accomplish this by adding a little bit of randomness into the, the pick variable that actually takes those rock parts off to create an experience that feels intentional and feels like you're really controlling how the rock bits might come off when it's really random. So you go through, you keep clicking. And at the end of the game, the score that you get is the number of blue lights in the center that touch. So if you have three lights in a group, that's a three. If you have four lights in a group, that's a four. This would be a two. So you keep clicking through until all the rock bits are gone. And sometimes you end up with a four, sometimes you end up with a two. One of the key parts about how this game ends up working is that it's not purely random. You have a much better chance to get rid of the outer circle than you do the inner circle. And one of the early splat examples is this inner outer, inner outer program, which takes advantage of the way the splat lights are numbered. So you could use the splat lights to do an outer ring and an inner ring. And in this particular use, we're trying to get rid of that outer ring first. <laughs> so and you can see there's a built-in delay. So as, as they're pressing on the splat or as they're using the virtual splat, it's how fast you click and how often you click really does affect how the game progresses. And getting your, your timing right and getting your score higher is actually something you can improve too. Awesome. This one is a hidden gem. <laughs> So but you can see some of the concepts there where it's, it's envisioning something that's in completely different from what the splat originally is. We're giving some feedback with the pick sound and you could do this with your foot, you could do this with your hand, you could do this virtually, and it ends up being a fun little activity that's not one of these larger group games that takes a lot of effort to set up. All right. Uh, so another one that we wanted to talk about was not necessarily just reimagining what your Slack can be, but also reimagining your space. So I wanted to turn this one over to, to Ryan and Paul again to talk through this one. Yeah, Paul can talk a little bit more about this in a second, but the Splat Bridge Relay is also from Pack 2 It's one of those that works uh, very well with physical splats in a socially distanced environment now too. It's essentially you have two splats and you need to use those two splats as stepping stones to work your way across whatever um, obstacle you want to imagine. We say it's a river that's flooded. You need to cross it using a rope bridge or using these big float, float pads. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can add to the, the texture of this game that aren't splats. So if you have obstacles, you can have cones, you can have desks that make the actual gameplay a little bit more difficult and more interesting and maybe require teamwork, maybe require some other physical activity you have to do in the meantime. There's also Adventure Splats in the same pack, which is a similar but more teamwork focused one where you have to pick up splats that you find around the room without letting go of any of them. And that too has a lot of adding desks, adding obstacles, and really imagining a space differently than it would be a classroom. Yeah, I think, um... And that ties back to the whole like, content shaping context, right? The idea that a classroom, or maybe if they're playing virtually, uh, just a space that they're in, uh, is something super familiar to them, right? And it becomes like, you know, they know their classroom, they know the layout, they kind of know the routine that they follow every day when they come in there. Um, but what this does is kind of allow them to look up and sort of look at things that maybe have just kind of fallen into the background, right? And, uh, and think about, oh, how can we use this as a potential obstacle? Or, or maybe that corner that like, we don't really use much in a classroom. Um, how can that become part of the game? 
Uh, so it's it's got it's really cool in that way, and I think like uh, definitely unique to to Splats is that you know it just sort of allows the whole environment um, to become part of and maybe even inspire the game itself, right? It might we might decide that um, you know we want to snake this around desks, right? And then along the way, we want to add some obstacles in the you know to come towards the bridge. Um, so yeah, just really using the game to um, to change the environment in the play, but also going back to like using the environment to shape the gameplay. And I think Bridge is a perfect game there where you can do that in a very kind of small, narrow space, or you can do it, you know, as we mentioned, just sneaking through obstacles. Definitely. All right, so some other examples of whenever, what we're thinking about when we come up with games is sometimes we're doing it for a very specific, specific objective. So um, in our fitness pack, um, even though we've got a wide variety of different games that are in there, um, we were, all of them came from a place of how can we get your heart rate up whenever you're in a small space. Um, so the objective was all around movement. Um, for the games that are in our intro to coding pack in the center here, um, again, we're all thinking about, okay, how can we introduce different blocks? And we're really, we're really focusing on the basics here. Um, so how can we have games feature those things? And then for games that are in our social emotional learning pack, again, the objectives are all around um, SEL core competencies. So all of this is really to say that um, the, all these practices that we use, we've taken pretty much from kids. Um, so we have now at this point have a lot of different examples of lots of different games coming from kids. And they use all of these things that, we, that we've talked about. They reimagine their space. They reimagine what a uh, splat can be. They think about like, Okay, what are, what are some games that we already play? Um, and so it's just a lot of fun. So I put on some examples of some of the favorite game write-ups that we've had uh, in the past. So using Duck Duck Goose with Splats, um, Bing Bag Toss. Um, this one is a zombie game. So uh, you're <laughs> basically, uh, you get infested <laughs> with zombies and then steal the bacon, but Splats version. So again, all taking this from what students are already doing. Cool. All, All right. right. Send this over to you, Tuan. So, you know, you can have the best laid plans and the best intentions, and that kind of means nothing sometimes when you like actually show up with the kids. And so I want to talk to you about the brass tacks of actually allowing kids to be independent in the classroom and like getting those games created. So I think a big part of that is embracing the mistake. Um, and embracing the mistake making that will happen all the time. So something I used to do in my classroom was we would give out the greatest mistake award for the kid who made the mistake that we learned from the most in the week. And the kids really looked forward to it. And it feels kind of corny in the beginning, but like once you have that sort of classroom mindset of like, I love making mistakes, mistakes help me learn, then like it could really lead to wonderful things, including games and game creation. So uh, just some like things that we're thinking about are like practicing debugging where the objective is to root out the mistake, celebrating the different paths that we take to get to the same outcome because play is this infinite thing, it never ends. And, and so like our activities, even though they have uh, an end in mind, we wanna like iterate that it, it isn't necessarily the goal to complete the game in one sitting. Sometimes that game needs the right mindset, it needs the right uh, resources. And so making sure that you're playing according to your mood and your needs at the time without feeling like you have to complete the game itself. And then we also really want to um, bring home the fact that you don't have to start with a blank screen. It can be very difficult to be faced with nothing. And I know for some people, including myself, it can feel very sort of like this is an enormous obstacle and I would rather avoid it. And so we thinking, keeping that in mind, we're creating a path in which we have chunks and snippets that students can start off with, with uh, different degrees of difficulty and really rethinking what it means to create a game. You don't necessarily have to start with nothing. You can start with a game that already is familiar. A lot of our favorite Splat games are indeed games that are already familiar to um, the players, such as Four Corners, and then we created Four Splat. 
I also do, I think a lot of you have seen or used this activity um, before, but the game creator activity is really just an example of that. So you start with an existing code, you might modify it a little bit, but it's all about focusing on the rules and providing context to that code that you already have that doesn't really do very much until you put rules on it. Mm -hmm. And then something I like to remind myself and uh, remind others is that programming is a language. And when you're learning a new language, you don't start off reading Tolstoy, you start off with like go dog go. And so the same applies when you're learning how to use Splat. It is a very different entity, a different type of animal. And so it's good to start off small. Some kids maybe will take to it right away, but again, everyone's different. And so I consider it my job and we really think about all the time, like what are the logistics and the barriers that we need to think of so that everyone can be successful in the classroom. And having said that, um, again, we think a lot about like uh, what a game is, like changing and like our, changing our definition of what a game is all the time. Because I feel like, especially at recess, you see kids playing all these different games and the rules aren't necessarily clear. There aren't necessarily clear winners or bad guys or anything. It's, it's just like, it's about having fun. It's about being flexible and being fluid. So this example is pulled from our intro to coding pack. Um, and I think this one is a good example of just like thinking about what a game is and what you can make a game out of. So really all this game is, is that you're having kids code some sort of simple program and then their partner has to figure out what it is that they actually coded. So they'll interact with their final game but not be able to see the code. And that's something that is actually really easy to turn into a game and students automatically turn it into a game. And so I think just following their lead and, and seeing what happens is cool. Um, and then some of you have played this game before with us. It's a brand new game coming to you soon, but it's based off of an existing game called Exquisite Corpse. And so this is a party game that um, people like to play in which you have three players and each are responsible for a section of a body and you're given a secret prompt. And so you draw your, for example, if I got the top and I had a cat, I would draw the, a cat's head. And if Emily had a middle and she had flamingo, she would have to draw the torso of a flamingo. And then in the end, your picture comes together into what is considered an exquisite corpse. But we thought about that for splats and we thought about access. So right now we know the reality is you can't always be together. And we, the reality is unfortunately not all students have access to all these different resources. And so we thought to ourselves, well, most schools have Google, most schools have access to Google Slides, Google Documents, and when you're coming together, you can still collaborate together on something that's fun and joyful and easy to share. And so we created a code in which Slack prompts an animal sound, and then the player takes that animal sound and they draw their portion of the animal on a Google Sheet that um, allows for multiple collaborators. And then in the end, you have your, your drawing. And then it's very easy to screenshot and screen share so that everyone can enjoy each other's masterpieces. Mm. So yeah, that's an example of like using what you have, the environment that you have and making the best of the situation. What, uh, what I think is great about that example too, Tuan, is that um, for people that are just introducing splats to your class, it's, it's a pretty simple command to just generate yeah. when, it, when a splat is pressed, play a random animal sound, right? So right out of the box, when you're introducing this, that's a great way to kind of like shift the mindset from like you're learning kind of block code, which, you know, they might have some experience with Scratch already or whatever, but here you're giving it an immediate like context that they can put that in and have some fun with it. And I think if you introduce it in that way, right out of the gate, they're going to move in parallel of thinking creatively as they're learning the blocks. And they'll probably be like really excited learning new concepts, coding concepts, because they're thinking that's going to get me to the next step to be yeah. able to do something it's like this. It's very much a game that feels low stakes, but high reward, which honestly is some of the best things to get a child to buy into what you're doing. And so we're always thinking of like ways to make sure that everyone has access and everyone has fun while learning. So really changing up our ideas of, we're changing our ideas and our plans along with you and hoping to grow with you. And like, it's so exciting that you're able to like use these resources with us. Um, so I'm going to, oh, quickly share my screen. I wanted to show everyone the cards. Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, when it comes to game creation, 
you don't necessarily have to start with nothing. And I know that for some kids, it's really hard to come up with ideas for games. And so again, playing with the idea of like using something familiar and then sort of being absurd and being silly and embracing mistakes, we created uh, these cards and I'll share my screen. And some of them have seen these too. They've gotten some facelifts since. Oh, uh, can everyone see the my screen with the unruly card? Thank you, Deb. Um, so what we were thinking in regards to like access, so not everyone has access to a printer, but we want everyone to be able to use these cards. And what these cards are is um, they basically are, they exist online in this sort of PowerPoint presentation form in which these different cards um, signal different things. So we have star cards that signal uh, movement. We have circle cards that signal rules and square cards that signal uh, coding. And so de depending on the number of players, you can play independently, you can play in partners or small group. Um, each player draws a certain amount of cards depending on how large your group is. And then you have to work together to create a game based on all these silly suggestions or suggestions for coding. And so they exist as um, a card game in which you can click on it and it takes you straight to the card itself and you click on the house and it takes you back to the card table. And so you draw your cards and you can record your cards using uh, a Google form. So in this form, you put in your school address, your email, and then it sends you a copy of your recording form and brainstorming sheet and it sends it to your teacher as well. And so you both have a record. Um, and this is an easy way to send your rules and your games to your friends as well or anyone you might be collaborating with. And so though we have this existing online for students who can't access a printer, but for some kids, they really want the ta um, tactile feel of the cards. And so we have a printable version as well. A game that, again, the same sort of rules apply, only this time they have the physical cards that they can print out and manipulate. And then there are choices at the top and the bottom so that again, giving that sense of like agency to the student, they can choose whether or not they want to apply the top prompt or the bottom prompt. And for their record keeping and sort of brainstorming, we create a printable version of the brainstorming sheet along with instructions. And so thinking about all the different types of learners and thinking about what all the different types of learners might need, um, again, like, I'm using my previous experience as a classroom teacher to inform a lot of the things I do now, but it's so incredibly important that we have open communication with teachers like you, and we really thank you for attending these webinars and giving us your honest feedback, because it's always informing our future work and our future content. So we have that that exists right now, and, but we also have a brand new resource that we're really excited to show everyone. So I stopped my screen, Emily, and I'm sending it back to you. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah. These game cards, the digital version is already up on the portal, and the physical copies will be going up soon. So you can find those on the portal. All right. So a controversial topic. I grew up in Texas, and we had these things, but we called them cootie catchers. And Emily, you grew up in the Midwest and they were also called cootie catchers, but then we were told, wait a minute, they're also called fortune tellers. And so um, we just, I, I know even just in the fourth and fifth grade, my students, they still loved playing with the cootie catcher or the fortune teller, whatever you want to call it. And so we were thinking about how do we incorporate that into Splats? Like that's such a silly, fun way to get the brain thinking and jump starting an idea. And so we decided to make a physical fortune teller that students can create themselves or print out. And then Ryan, who is a genius, created a code version of the catcher. We're gonna go over both. Yeah. So these are brand new ideas. You are looking at the prototype, but um, it's a new way of thinking about the future, I like to say, because it's a fortune teller but you choose your colored splat and then um, the numbers dictate how many turns you take on the fortune teller. And then this version of the fortune teller is a sort of more uh, entry level. And it has some of the simpler um, actions such as keeping score, playing a sound, making sure that a part of the code includes pressing down on the splat. 
And then as your students feel more confident and as they um, feel more independent using the code, then you can gradually release and then have the, the standards and the stakes be higher. So we'll have a uh, blank version of the fortune teller where students can kind of fill in their own prompts but you can raise the bar gradually and sort of incorporate more of that sense of unruliness and abstract thinking by including some of the more complicated um, codes such as functions and while do, but also more abstract ideas like the six feet apart dance, which both means nothing and incredibly something to someone. And so this is about celebrating where a child can take the, the limited amount of like information you give them. And so, Part of my favorite games have always been games that I can't even describe to people now when I was a child. Sometimes it just involved looking at someone until you had to blink and then you were out, but then you were also a wizard. And you know, it's just, <laughs> it's about being silly and having fun and we're trying to mimic that thinking through the resources. So look forward to a fortune teller cootie catcher coming to you soon, a school near you. <laughs> and yeah, like like two said, you can start from either side. You can either start randomizing your game concepts and start from a very uh, game concept heavy side, or I made a little a little set of blocks that will do the opposite and start from some blocks where it'll generate just a few blocks, and that's all you have to work with. So instead of having a couple of rules and that's all of the rules you work with, this is based on the. Uh, inside outside example, the uh, splat minor example, it does the inside outside lights again. This color right here will be the outside lights, and that is the kind of block that you can ma use as many of as you want. So in this case, the control blocks, which are very important and kind of make a lot of the programs work, we're going to have as many of those as we want in our game, and then the inner part of the splat will be a random number of colored blocks that we can pick and use as our game. So very quickly, someone would write down on a piece of paper or just note quickly that we get two starting blocks, two math blocks, one light blocks, get one variable, and then as many control blocks as we want. And the stopwatch started, so we need to write down, do quickly, and then get our game built from that. And that means it's not a lot of blocks, so you need to be very creative and get a lot of higher level imagination into your game. Just as an example. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we should do one. So let's, yeah. Uh, yeah, so quick run again, and then let's pull some blocks out and see what we can make up on the board. So we got uh, one math, three scoring, and a lot of controls. Okay. But we don't have any starting blocks in this one. So in this one, it's you can also use your, your starting, um, this program itself. So with one math block, we can get some of these comparative blocks. So I have a when splat press and when program starts. So let's get rid of these things that helped us pick blocks and make a game out of it. So we also have a couple of scoring blocks. We can change splat score by one and negative one, maybe. Let's try that. That seems good. So when the program starts, comparative, and then a bunch of controls. So we can do so many things. So when the program starts, let's, we maybe even don't need that. We could compare, so when splat pressed, we can increase the score on the splat and then if it's over a certain amount. We can also go with some sensing ones because they're a similar color. What were our other blocks, Ryan? So we had changing the splat score. We had two scoring blocks, one math block, and then what else? A whole bunch of controls? Yeah, a whole bunch of controls. So very simply, if we started with just splat pressed and splat released, you can start building a many feet game where as the splat's pressed, it makes a score. When it's released, it gets a score removed. And then you're trying to get to a certain score point. 
if you want to try and compare them, you could keep impressing, pressing the add to your score, compare it to say it's too high or not high enough with your if else block, and then build off of that. Like what, what would we do that would keep pressing a splat to increase a score? Like um, a moon, moon jumping game. So something that is maybe physically fit where you're just using it as a fitness jumping up and down splat with our change splat score. True. So you hit like jumping over waves or something. And every time you get hit by a wave, you lose a point. Yeah. Like and you see where constricting down the number of blocks that you use, maybe in addition to your, your rules cards would make some really outside the box games. Or the fortune teller. Yes. Yeah, the floor could be lava, and so you can't move, and it's a race to get to somewhere. It's three teams, and you have to press certain the press the splat a certain amount of times, but only when the floor is not lava. Yeah, well, the splat <laughs> has to stay pressed. So in this in this in this scenario, the score will stay one while it's pressed, and then go to zero when it's not pressed. So you need yeah. to keep one of the splats pressed while you all hold it at the same time and run across the room. Yeah, or hold and it with your arms extended. <laughs> and you have to rescue the grand wizard. There's always yes. a wizard. There's always a I, I only <laughs> want to play a game with wizards. <laughs> we rolled wizards, so we have to keep, keep the wizards. But yeah, that, that was a pretty challenging example, but there's a lot that you can start with from a few, few blocks. Awesome. And that's a great instance in which one person might be more familiar with the blocks and gives you a classroom ambassador, and one person might just be full of ideas, but everyone kind of gets to contribute and everyone gets to play, and that's sort of the joy of it. All right, so we did an amazing job today. It is, we have 15 minutes left, which is amazing. Oh, wow. Um, but shameless plug, uh, we have additional sessions this week. Um, the main one I've been trying to get everybody to go to is the focus group, um, but make sure to go to unreleasedplats.com slash bootcamp to check out the other ones. And as usual, always shoot us an email. You can email any of us directly, just our first names at unruly-studios.com, or you can send one to educators at unruly-studios.com. And we'd love to hear what you think or if you have any questions or anything that you'd like for us to go over. Um, this time is really for you. So if you need to go, uh, feel free. But um, we'd love to talk through other stuff with you too, if you can stick around. Any questions or initial thoughts about the new stuff that we shared today? Or any ideas you might have for a resource you would really like to see in your classroom? One of the things we didn't quite talk about as much as, as maybe we meant is that it, there's not a, a certain set of rules when it comes to game creation, right? It's, it's as much as letting kids explore that uh, imaginary space when making games, you can do the same, right? So making a game out of really any obscure thought, any game you've played before, shows, movies, any little bit of interesting activities can turn into a really fun game. It can really be anything. Yeah, part, part of the brainstorming template is prompting kids to think about what are their favorite games that they've played before, and then thinking about what made those games enjoyable to them. Was it because there was always a clear winner? Was it because you got to uh, have very interesting like pieces? You got to play with money? Like, What were the things that made, made you like that game so much? and then using that as a springboard for creating your own game. One other um, fun thing to do is like, uh, one of the included games we have is called Sheep Hurdler. And uh, when, I, when I came up with that game, it was, I mean, it's really just like, like a running and then you have to jump over something like a hurdling uh, type game, but just using the built-in sound of the sheep suddenly just like made that game super funny to, to my kids. Like they, they just, they were playing it and Every time that sheep sound came on, like it was, you know, we don't want to step on the sheep, we have to, you know. Uh, so even just something like that, if you just take like a very simple basic game and then look through the offerings in the app and play around with sounds and, and you know, be a little unexpected. Um, I love like Shel Silverstein, he's sort of like a, always has been a creative muse to me, but I even think like, well, you know, of, of um, his writing and his work and just how unexpected 
he was and, and how he really just understood kind of the way that, that children think, which is why I think he's so uh, well, well embraced by them. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's something that uh, I think is a pretty powerful to, tool as well. Just little switch ups can change the whole game. And the opposite of that might be the, uh, the built game of a splatter shoot. We're trying to use code to replicate something that's otherwise a fairly simple activity. It's almost hard to call it a game, but in, in practice with the splats, the, the action that is intended with the pressing the outside splats as fast as you can to be doing the umbrella waving is, is very, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a very um, noisy and unruly thing. Now, if you're if you're back in a gym and, and you know obviously uh, COVID might prohibit some of this, but if you're uh, you can also combine the two, right? You can create a game, or if you have the parachute going, and somebody has to run in the middle and press the splat until it's green, and then get out of there. So, um, just kind of incorporating splats into existing PE games is uh, it's kind of a cool way to think about it too. So I hadn't thought of that, but the the splatter shoot game would actually sync perfectly with using an actual splatter shoot, an actual parachute. Because um, you could just be standing on them or hitting them with your feet. I've been really trying to embrace wait times. I feel like I this is always my thing, but it's a, a personal quest of mine of to increase the amount of wait time because that was something I was particularly bad about in the classroom. Was actually giving enough wait time. I think the average wait time in a like a crap, I don't remember what study it was, but it was like, it was only a number of seconds. And what everybody said their wait time was, was like, oh, that was really long. That was like over 10 seconds. And it was like two seconds. So we're good. I'm going to have some silence as my personal quest. <laughs> you can code a, code a timer for that, where it's just like, yes, ask a question, step on the splat, and then behind you, the splats will slowly fill up. I was like thinking through the possibility of creating like um, just recently a show on Netflix started becoming available. It's like an old game show where you're in a grocery store and you have to go find grocery store objects. Yes. Supermarket sweep. Okay. Yes. Supermarket sweep. I was trying to think of like what's a version of that we could play with the splats where like you have to press on the splat for a certain amount of time in order to keep it active but you also have to go fetch certain objects and you have to do it so quickly and come back and press this flat so that it doesn't turn off and it resets like a timer or something. That's pretty like, similar to a resource gathering one I was thinking yeah. of early on too. I want a supermarket sweeps. So to Anne, I was thinking you can make different colors worth different amounts of money. Cause like oh, a supermarket yeah. sweep, the smart shopper yeah. goes right to the meat department right. and got the big the like ham. briskets or hams or whatever. <laughs> so like pink could be worth more points yes. than like yes. purple. And like, do you wait for the pink to come up or do you just get all the purples you can? Oh my gosh, this Something would like be that. amazing. I <laughs> love supermarket sweep, loved it. It's, it's just all those hams, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just love it. <laughs> I'm going to wait on the, the cyan razor blade packs that are like $30 each and then just mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's right. It was always like, it was like the meat department or things like that. Like, you know, razor yep. blades. That would be so fun. Similar, <laughs> similar game to that was um, like a Minecraft style game where you keep hitting all the splats to get a certain combination of colors. Like if you want a thing that's 10 points, you need pink, pink, red, blue. And then if you want 15 points, it's cyan, 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 cyan. And, and you have to go through and hit all the splats as fast as you can and then like hold all of the right colors at the same time to get oh, your points. Yeah. So that this kind of collection and running around games can be a lot of fun. And it's like, sometimes it's just recreating an experience. It's like, I never got the chance to do a supermarket sweep. <laughs> but, I, but there were splats one day. <laughs> But one thing even sort of related to that with like, do you wait or do you just kind of move fast is like, if you think about, we talked about bean bags in there, I was incorporating like using bean bags is a similar thing where if you change the color randomly and maybe like, you know, purple is, you know, the, the big 10 point one, but um, do you wait on that or do you just keep trying, you know, so you can 
sort of randomize the color, assign points to that, and just kind of, you know, set the challenge of you just keep mm -hmm. going for whatever you can get or sort of wait, be strategic because you have to run and fetch the beanbag. So that uses up time too. So. so you can have the meat be on the other side of the gym and do you, you know, press green or whatever, kind of like the relay race to start. You press green and then do you go get meat or do you go get something that's closer, diapers that might be closer? And then, you, and then you have to run back, tap the first flat, and then you're going back out shopping. And do you Baby keep going formula. further away or do you go closer, shorter trips? You can make this super supermarket sweep happen. I, I'm so excited. <laughs> you could even apply a timer to that. And if you don't make it back to the, mm -hmm. to the checkout fast enough, the meat will spoil and turns yep. whatever color. <laughs> I mean, we have to make this happen now. I'm going to be super disappointed <laughs> otherwise. I didn't realize I was on Netflix. So I have to check that out again. No, I, it, that in years. I, I saw it on Netflix and I was like, hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy for the day, canceling my meetings. <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> I like to imagine that you actually said that out loud, like by yourself. Yeah. You're just like, <laughs> Netflix. I mean, like, I, I've never been much of, like, a potty mouth, but, like, especially when I became a teacher, it's, like, I replaced everything that could possibly even be seen as, like, uh, like, obscene with, like, hot dog, like, gosh darn it, like, tickle my goose, like, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Oh, my gosh. Just looking to Jimmy Stewart for, uh, for the clean way to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you all have any other ideas or any other things that you would like, any <laughs> game shows you'd like to turn into Splats games, let us know. We're yeah. happy to make them. And they're all sort of Takeshi's Castle, right? Like at some point, every Splats game ends up being Takeshi's Castle. Yeah, Takeshi's Castle. Um, American Wipeout, <sighs> sort of. The like obstacle course race of very different obstacles that you end up having to take all on and then reset all the varieties of obstacles in those mm -hmm. types of games yeah they actually just made one um it's a few years old that is that plus mini golf because oh, that's that's holy moly. it is holy moly mm -hmm. and that's the evolution of <laughs> Takeshi's castle and all these big obstacle course games that now you do it plus mini golf because that's really funny this is a whole new world i didn't know fully existed yeah there's a lot of those like obstacle games that I feel like there's like a new one all the time now. There's one on Netflix literally called The Floor is Lava, which is That's fairly, fairly yeah. terrible. <laughs> but you can't stop watching once you start. <laughs> Double Dare was the big one for me growing up. I always dreamed of going on that set. The obstacle course, I think, came at the very end of that, uh, or they had these physical challenges, but splats would be great in Double Dare. Any ideas? All right. Well, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Oh, thanks for coming. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Bye. Supermarket sweep, it's got to happen. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. I want a Minecraft game with 12 splats. <laughs> and you need to like make something that has 12 very specific colors. Oh, we got to turn the recording off. Yes.